We're very pleased to have Dr. Ivor Miller, who, uh, if you have read the, uh, the the biography, has devoted many decades of his life to really important work with uh, with communities um, in uncovering in. Um, in really documenting uh, cultural heritage on on two on three con well three places, um, he's worked in uh, looking at both um, hip hop, everything from uh, subway painters in New York City to the traditions of belief in power in contemporary Cuba, and has done quite a bit of work on Yerba. Um, derived initiation ceremonies, uh, and, and you can read uh, a lot about what he's done, but I wanted to introduce Dr. Miller to tell um, a little bit more about his work and to introduce his guest here. We are very pleased to have him here as a fellow and as an ongoing colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's such a privilege for me to be able to talk about how I do what I do because a lot of what I do is kind of intuitive um, and I've kind of figured it out myself with the help of a few mentors and I've never been asked to really talk about this before so it's a wonderful opportunity. I put together some ideas and I'm going to start with the current stuff and then go back in time to how I began. Uh, we have some very important guests today uh, from Cameroon. We have two chiefs of the Ekpe Leopard Society tradition, Seseku Ojom Borok and Seseku Joseph Mbu. You are highly welcome. Thank you for being here to support uh, this event. We are working together on projects. They are, they are part of a big community that has re-establish their homeland traditions here in the Washington area. So when I applied to come to the Folk Life and the Museum of African Art, the, their community wrote a letter of support and, with, and we are working together. It's a wonderful experience. I also want to thank Amy Staples who's here with us, uh, particularly because Amy is um, initiating a very important project on digital repatriation, which I'm working in some ways with taking archival photographs of Africa, which in many cases are poorly quoted, taking copies back to Africa to get information about them which is correct, sharing this with Africans so they can see their visual history. Very important work, and I am <coughs> really proud to be part of that. Um, I thought, and I want to just read all my colleagues here at Folk Lab. It's been a wonderful uh, experience knowing you all. Through 25 years of experience conducting oral history research in various communities, I have observed that the leaders of most communal practices lean towards either orthodoxy or innovation. While each tendency is probably meant to protect or promote the tradition, I have found myself working most often with innovators or people who adapt their practices to the present condition while seeking to communicate or build bridges with innovators of other traditions. This kind of research is based upon forging relationships with culture bearers that allow me to collaborate with them in the process of documentation, interpretation, and public presentation. I base my approach upon the premise that culture bearers are the experts and I am not. I am, I am there to learn and act <coughs> as a communicator to help the community leaders share what they want to share to help them make <clears throat> as full a statement as they wish to about who and what they are. This process began in college in my hometown, then extended to New York City, to Cuba, and currently to Nigeria and Cameroon in Western Central Africa. At present, we are involved in working with African descendants to reach back over a tremendous historic and geographical gap to understand the cultural sources the process of regrouping in diaspora and how communities on both sides of the Atlantic can help each other understand their shared history. So that's my, re that's my red statement. 
and I want to kind of take you through some of this stuff, and then I hope we can have a conversation. I'll go on for about 20 minutes. Uh, first of all, we have this slide was taken in the Musée Quai Branly in Paris, 2007. I was invited uh, to organize a group from Calabar, Nigeria, and their historically related people in Cuba. So we had four days of basic interaction, communication through music, dance, and chanting in their indigenous languages. No rehearsals. It just kind of happened at the last minute, and it was incredibly successful. But let me give you a little background about this diaspora. Next slide, please. OK, there are three major groups in the entire history of forced migrations of Africans from the late 1400s to the late 1800s. And these are the West Central Africans, uh, Congo, Congo, Angola, the Cross River region, also known as Bight of Biafra, and called Karabali in the Americas, and the Yoruba speakers. And there are, there are many others too, but these are the three major ones in places like Brazil, Trinidad, Haiti, and Cuba. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in their, in, in, demographically, the largest is Congo, Angola, Central Africa. That's all over the Americas. Cross River region is second, and Yoruba is third. But interestingly, the Yoruba is most famous why is that? It's because in Africa, the Yoruba speakers have created a standardized language based on a bunch of different related languages. They've written about their history and mythology. They've created a huge literature about themselves and their history. And this is very important for people in America to turn to. This has not happened in the Congo region, partly because since the Belgian colonists, there's been wars in that area, there's been disruption. I mean, really since the slave trade, but, uh, and it's still ongoing, so it's a real issue for us trying to understand that area. And in the Cross River region, it's one of the most linguistically diverse regions in the world. And this is the area of the, the so-called Bantu migration 3,000 years ago throughout the waves of migration throughout Africa. Um, there's, a, there's at least 50 languages in the area where I work in, and there are a lot of autonomous communities that are held together through shared culture. And one of those is the Ekpe Leopard Society, which is the indigenous government. In the 1830s, this institution was recreated in colonial Havana, and it still exists with 150 lodges, uh, over 20,000 members, and a huge um, output of they're, they're very important in popular culture of Cuba and the popular music. And so a lot of what I do is look at recorded music, which in Havana starts in 1916 or something. And we're trying to do comparative, scientific comparative research. But in order to do that, I have to go to a lot of villages in West Africa, kind of, because there's no books to turn to. What we look at, we turn to elders and reconstruct and share information about Cuba and that leads to lots, lots of conversations. Next slide, please. So we're back in Paris in 2007. Let's check out just a little piece of that improvised uh, situation. And what we're going to see the Africans on the left and the Cubans on the right. And the Cubans are chanting and they're saying Yamba, which is a major title. And one of the Yambas from Nigeria responds and dances over to them. Next slide, please. So there goes the Yamba over to greet the Cubans. He turns back and he greets the mask. The language the Cubans are, are singing is based on a uh, cross river language, and many of the Nigerians understand this. Yeah, you're 
Okay, next slide, please. Based on this experience, this incredibly rare experience paid for by, with French tax dollars, uh, the Cubans responded. These are Cubans who live outside the island. So they're in New York City and then Europe. The, the, those in New York created a album. It was a, a response to this event, and they're calling, it's called the Iyenison in Kama Project. Iyenison in in the ethic language of Calabar means son of the soil, the owners of the land, which is a very important issue, obviously, owning the land. Iyenison Kama, Kama is to speak or to talk. The owners of the land are speaking. And uh, they presented the CD in uh, Joe's pub in 2009, is that right? 2009. Mm -hmm. These two sesikus were there. It was an incredible experience because when that mask came out, they started interacting and speaking, which is a form of African literacy. Uh, so Iyenison Kama comes out, which is a, if <coughs> the Cubans are innovatively using their inherited tradition and fusing it with what they're learning from the Africans. Next slide, please. And here we are at the CD party. Next slide, please. Huh. Around that time in 2009, I finally came out after 15 years of work on this book about migration from West Africa into Cuba, the foundation of a society, all based, basically the whole book is based on song. But you won't know that unless I tell you because it's all, it's all based on interpreting ritual language which is sung in ceremonies. And so I essentially took Cuban data back to Calabar, <coughs> and elders there began to translate. And we've translated about 30% of our language into the ethic language. There's a lot of Ejagam, which um, our Seseku speak in other languages in that re region. One of the most <coughs> linguistically diverse regions of the world, very few linguists are working there a serious problem, just like archaeology. What archaeology? Linguistics, very little of it. So we're trying to build with scholars in that area and move forward. Next slide, please. Now, this is just kind of fun for me. Uh, this is the Ekama community. I just told you about the Yenison Ekama, which is the album. Turns out, the Cubans know <laughs> in their literature that Nasako was the founder of Abakwa society in Africa centuries ago. I heard about a person named Nasako in Cameroon and after years of trying to communicate we found, we talked to each other, I told them about Nasako in Cuba. <coughs> they instantly got excited and they created a festival and this is the first one. <coughs> and um, this is way out in the bush in Cameroon and it's the Akama community. So I'm presenting my book to them, and I put on the Akama CD. And so everyone is kind of like, what do we do? <laughs> and so I start dancing. And this is just one the very important thing in diplomacy in Africa is dancing with people. It probably doesn't work very well in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> but. It, I, I, should, I have a video of this, but I don't have it here, but it's just incredible how people start responding and coming out. Next slide. So there we are. Next slide. And next slide. And next slide. Good. So it was just you know, an incredible way, because we don't speak the same language, basically. They don't know who the heck I am. We're playing music that's supposedly related to them. And, it's, it's, and they're, they're calling out a comma which is pretty amazing, but it was really just hanging out and dancing with people that broke all the ice. And after that, they did divination, which is the basket in, in front of us. They did some very simple divination to ask the gods of the land if what we were doing <coughs> was um, appropriate. And the answer was yes. Next slide. So we have more dancing. <laughs> Celebration of peace. Everybody is happy. Next slide. Okay. We're talking about Saturday night, Saturday night, Saturday Thank you. Okay. So that's um, kind of the methodology that I'm working with. I'm going across the water, sharing data 
a lot of the videos I take in Africa, I go to Cuba and I just give them out to culture leaders. And they are studying this stuff in their communities. And that all comes back to me because they are recognizing things in their tradition, which I don't know. But I get to learn from this because <coughs> they're getting information they want. So um, <coughs> I started in college as a dancer. That's kind of how I got into African stuff. And uh, my teacher was Eno Washington. He was a working class African American from Mississippi and Oregon. You know, uh, we, we decided to do a video about his work, total shoestring stuff. But uh, the interesting thing about this is it was based in, you know, uh, when was it, in the 50s, Alan Lomax recorded Jelly Roll Morton. Jelly Roll Morton sits at a piano and starts telling the, the story of jazz and his own life. What Eno does in this video, and we only had one shoot basically, he told a narrative and he danced. So it's really in the same genre of Jelly Roll Morton, Mr. Jelly Roll Morton. Let's take a little look. Oops. We're talking about Saturday night, Saturday night tavern, Sunday night tavern, Monday night tavern, uh, gambling. A lot of fun. We would do the Watusu, the Madison, the Roach, the Jerk, the Swim, the mashed Potatoes, the Alligator, the Boogaloo, the Silly Dog, the Emma Stop. The list is endless. The, East the first Dan, recording the of Black Dance, Dan, Thomas Edison. East Generation, under another name. basic things that I learned in that process was get a tape deck, record the interviews because you're creating historical documents, and keep quiet, listen to the people, don't bring your own theories on, onto them, learn from them, they're the experts. Share your transcripts with them, let them read so they can make changes, and stay in touch because uh, I started this project in 1986, the book came out in 2012. 
and actually being rejected turned out to be a very positive thing because it, it helped me go back and rethink and stay in touch and it, in the end of the process I started meeting a lot of painters I didn't know who were very important to the process. So the um, title of the book comes from the painting, Paris All Kingdom by Vulcan there on the cover. And on the back is a, a tribute to Martin Luther King and it's kind of the idea that this culture was created by young people to break through, <coughs> to break through the racism of the New York, uh, of the gangs in the New York you know, barrios. And they created inter interracial uh, crews, the white paint. Next slide. Huh. In the early 90s, I started going to Cuba. I went to dance with the National Folklore Troupe and started working with a lot of elders in the Afro-Cuban traditions, the African drive traditions of Cuba. And because there was a lot of Yorba studies happening in this country, that was my first interest. I started working with the Yorba Lukumi people. And these are some very important people in the Matanzas tradition. Uh, next slide. I shared some of my, after many years of learning in Cuba, I shared information with Professor Juan de Abimbula, a very important um, scholar of the Yorba Ifa tradition in West Africa. He just was part of promoting it to UNESCO World Heritage recently. We did a book together, which is just a conversation sharing you know, what is the thunder god Shango like in Africa? This is how it is in Cuba. And the book became, it was never published in Cuba, but it was translated into Spanish by the community itself, and it's an underground classic in Cuba. Next slide. And because of that, there started a whole movement of reorientation towards African information. And this group, Iletutun, <coughs> means the new land or the new earth. And uh, this, uh, they, this diviner who's in, in running it is created, um, really links with Africa to learn the language and learn medicinal practices and stuff. Next slide. And I uh, was very interested to see a couple of years ago that some of the Cubans are changing their language based on information in this book, but they're coming from Yorba. Instead of the Anya drum, it's now Ayan, following the Yorba tradition. So. That says to me that African descendants in the Americas want information and they don't get it through their educational systems. That's why this kind of sharing is so important and hopefully will lead to better educational systems. Next slide. Along the way in Havana, I met Andres Flores, who was in his 80s. He was a descendant of the Carabali. He was a Carabali person. His great grandfather had come from Calabar. Next slide. I worked with him for seven years. He basically saw me as an opportunity to tell the story of his people. So I recorded him, transcribed, shared it with him. Next slide. Gave him the literature written about his own tradition, which he was critiquing. I, you know, we, we, got, we got him glasses, an ear, an ear, hearing aid, and all that stuff, but it really was an amazing process and um, next slide okay Andres taught me this song Okobio Yeni song I want to be Kura Mendo Nukwe Ite Ororo Kande Ethic Ebuton I published this in about 2000 in an essay some Nigerians contacted me we understand this language we know what this is <coughs> next slide because uh, Efeke Buton was the first lodge founded by Africans in Cuba. And that's a, it's a village in Calabar, it's part of Calabar. So based on that, the Efeke people in New York, they have an association here. I mean, they're all over the country, but they had a meeting in New York. The Cubans were there. I invited the Cubans, and they had the first real encounter in, uh, in Brooklyn in 2001. And you see the, the Nigerians are in the back watching the Cubans display, and. Um, earlier the Nigerians had performed for the Cubans. Next slide. 2004, I was able, thanks to a grant, to go to Calabar. Immediately, the Calabar leaders of this tradition recognized the importance of the Yamapua <coughs> language. The governor of Cross River State paid for the trip of the two Cubans who are sitting next to me in the White House. And um, 
that was an incredible experience. Next slide. So essentially, all of this research has been happening. I mean, I'm not a festival promoter. It's not my job. I'm a researcher. But because this tradition is performed, I am, as part of my research, promoting festivals. Uh, because I get to learn that way. And so here we all are in a stadium. Um, members of very, uh, different language groups are all together because it's a shared culture with the Cubans. Next slide. And so um, after several years of working in Calabar, I have started going into the hinterlands, which is a very important part of this whole story because people were coming from the hinterlands to, the, you know, to, to, to migrate. So here I am, uh, I've usually got a video camera and a, and a still photo camera in my hand. Next slide. Another important thing is uh, collaboration with scholars in Nigeria. This is Professor Margaret Okon, who's a linguist, who is helping me document the tone markers on some of the languages. That um, I'm, I'm, I've got a whole study on Ekpe songs, because the Cubans have a lot of songs. What are the songs like? In how do we compare? I'm trying to document the songs in Africa to do comparative projects. And linguists are very helpful. Next slide. And here we are together with this elder man is the Ayamba, who was actually in Paris. He came to Paris with us. He speaks a very rare language, which is endangered, and we're working with him on that. Next slide. Here I am recording singers in one village. Next slide. OK, same thing. Next slide. And uh, this is an amazing festival that a village, agricultural village does every seven years. I'm trying to make a film about this. <coughs> Next slide. And this was some recordings we did in the process of applying to UNESCO to, to, uh, for ECPE as a world heritage, world intangible. And Next slide. And here the, the, the guy who made the thing happen in Paris, came to Calabar to visit me, and so we were working together to document. Next slide. Uh, an important part of research in this culture is dealing with paramount rulers, traditional leaders, and here I've taken my shoes and my hat off, and I'm offering my hands to a traditional ruler who's blowing his breath onto my hands as a form of blessing. Next slide. And uh, I was lucky to be a Fulbrighter for two years in Nigeria, just finished that, working with the, um, working with the University of Calabar, which is a federal university. So now I'm taking this project to the federal level, and here I'm with the, the vice chancellor of the university and some professors and um, some musicians. Next slide. So the idea is that I'm taking this stuff and I'm trying to promote it at the highest level I can. Now as a result of this, to conclude, as a result of this work in Africa, I come back to Cuba and I have a whole different relationship with the Cubans because <coughs> instead of being someone trying to penetrate their mysteries, trying to find out what they're doing behind the closed doors, I'm someone that's sharing information with them <coughs> about their sources, um, which they have never been able to, to do before. So um, I was encouraged by one of the Cubans to kind of come out publicly instead of doing it underground. We, have a, we had a, a Roomba party, you know, welcome to Dr. Miller from West Africa. And for those who know the Cuban Roomba tradition, these are some of the very heavy people. Uh, they're really cultural leaders in this. Um, and so at this point, I'm just kind of, uh, last year, the Institute for Anthropology in Cuba had the first ever conference on Ekpe culture. And so at this point we're working with institutions and just sharing information and, and moving forward. Next slide. Aha. The last point. This is not oral history, it turns out. In the 19th century, African cultural bearers began to write down their traditions. These are kept, for the most part, they're kept unpublished, they're secret for initiates only. Now because I have contact with speakers of African languages, the Cubans have allowed me to see some of these manuscripts and parts of them, they're uh, 
that they that they choose, I'm able to copy and share with African linguists. So now we have a whole linguistic thing going on. Next slide. And now, um, so these two elders are from different generations, but look at that book. There's hundreds of books like this, uh, Cross River History in Cuba, which have never been looked at by scholars, even in Cuba. And now this elder is teaching one guy, this other person, a song from that book. And all these songs relate to the history of their people. Next slide. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next slide. Okay. That brings us to Washington, D.C. In November, I was uh, very privileged to work with the Sese Cruz of Vecta uh, USA, two of them who are here. And we're, uh, we had just finished a, a presentation with some Cubans who came out from New York. And so we are, um, uh, my basic agenda is I hope to work with the Folk Life Center to uh, expand this project and, and take it to a higher level where we can have a real exchange. It's, isn't it curious that this Nigerian Cameroonian Cuban project is happening here in the USA? That's, it's an irony, but that's what's happening. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to conversation. Thank you so much.